the presidents of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and the Obesity Society, Stacy Bredauer and Alan Levine. Well, thanks, thanks very much and welcome. Thanks for joining us for the fifth annual Obesity Week. Uh, with hopefully many more to come. The American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and the Obesity Society are, are proud to bring together exceptional scientists, surgeons, clinicians, policymakers, and industry in the field of obesity to learn from one another and to exchange ideas. The field of obesity has been making great strides and garnering recognition among the public and the policymakers. This year was marked by key publications redefining how we talk about obesity, the negative impact of stigmatizing this disease, and we've also seen high-impact papers supporting the surgical treatment and the adoption of guidelines endorsing surgical treatment of type 2 diabetes in patients with obesity. So working together, we've been able to make a great impact in these areas by paving the way for growth and innovation, and all of you here can help make that happen. This week will play a significant role in our ability to understand the complexities of obesity and provide better care for our patients. In our fifth year of Obesity Week, we're making significant strides bringing together science, surgery, and clinical practice. As of today, we have more than 4,800 attendees here at Obesity Week registered from 62 countries, and we have 139 uh, companies exhibiting this year. So we're really looking forward to a bright future for Obesity Week. And at this point, I'd like to turn things over to the TOS president, Al Levine. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks so much. Um, it's my privilege to thank the hardworking people that brought Obesity Week together. As you might imagine, this is a huge undertaking, and we have a group, a great group of ASMBS and TOS members working collaboratively to put together this year's outstanding program. First, we'd like to thank the TOS and ASMBS executive council members who have worked together to provide the vision and the strategic guidance for Obesity Week. Um, working behind the scenes is, of course, a very important group called the Obesity Week Board of Managers, which is made of representatives from both of our societies. They identify ways to work together to enhance the meeting while preserving the integrity and the tradition of each of the individual society programs. The success of our meeting is also dependent on the support and involvement of our industry partners. We would like to thank these partners for their sponsorship and their educational grant support. Will you join me in a round of applause to thank them? <laughs> Lastly, it's imperative that we recognize two individuals who steer the program from beginning to end each year, the Obesity Week Chair and Co-Chair. This year's Chair, Pat o Dr. Pat O'Neill, represents TOS, and this year's Co-Chair, Dr. M John Morton, represents ASMBS. They work tirelessly to bring you a program that is filled with internationally renowned speakers on the cutting edge of obesity science, advances in clinical management of obesity, and obesity public policy. Again, as you might imagine, the birth of Obesity Week took years of planning and collaboration and took two exceptionally dedicated individuals to drive that ship. That is Gary Foster and Phil Schauer. It is for that reason that the councils of both societies created the Foster Shower Travel Grant to bring early career investigators or international professionals to Obesity Week each year in the spirit of our collaboration. Each of these recipients receives $2,500 as a travel grant. It's my privilege to announce the third annual recipients selected by the respective program committees from ASMBS and TOS. The ASMBS recipient is Sarah Sarr for brief group treatment of binge eating behaviors in a pre-surgical bariatric population in a rural setting. And the TOS recipient is Katrine Corbiel for bone loss mechanisms after sleeve gastrectomy and ruin y gastric bypass. Now I'd like to ask obesity chair, one moment, <laughs> before I do that, we have our award winners. Sarah? I wanted to make sure we have that happen. I'll come back and check this one. Thank you. Thank you. Right, you guys can come off with me here. Okay, 
At this point, I'd like to invite our Obesity Week Chair, Pat O'Neill, to come to the stage. Pat. Good morning. The Obesity Week working relationship between TOS and ASMBS is a true collaboration, and I believe I can speak for all of the Board of Managers in saying that it's been very rewarding to work with this team. Co-locating our meetings brings us together to enjoy unique events and to hear exceptional speakers. I hope you all enjoyed last night's welcome reception found it e and found it easy to find your peers for some enjoyable networking. This week, we're particularly proud of our lineup of keynote speakers. We're excited to have Dr. Rudolph Leibel talk about his groundbreaking research, and also want to bring your attention to the keynote on Thursday at 11 a.m. that explores how obesity impacts professional athletes. For 16 hours over the course of the next three days, you'll have the chance to learn about products and services from more than 130 companies that are supporting our meeting by hosting exhibits in our 175,000 square foot exhibit hall. That's nearly three football fields. We'll serve complimentary lunches and coffee in the exhibit hall each day. New this year, we'll have table topic signs on many of the lunch tables. Look for a topic that interests you and join in a lively discussion over lunch. It's a wonderful opportunity to make connections with your peers and you might come up with some great new ideas. This week we're debuting Obesity Week backstage in the middle of the exhibit hall. In this area, you'll be able to meet Obesity Week keynote speakers, take photos, learn about social media, maybe pick up some cooking ideas, and more. Be sure to check the daily schedule on the app or in your printed schedule at a glance. Please join us there right after this morning's keynote lecture for a meet and greet with Dr. Libel at Obesity Week backstage. Speaking of the app, please be sure to download the Obesity Week 2017 app. It'll help you navigate the meeting space and exhibit hall, create your personal agenda, connect with your peers, and see Obesity Week social media posts. We have a new feature in the app this year. You can use the credentials printed on your badge to log into the app and do your session evaluations and claim continuing education credits in real time. We're also excited about the annual After Dark Party, starting at 9 p.m. Wednesday, right here at the hotel in the spectacular new Riverview Ballroom. We've brought back last year's great band, Party on the Moon, for your listening and dancing enjoyment. I'd like to say a special thank you to my co-chair and someone who I have enjoyed working with this past year, Dr. John Morton. Would you please recognize Dr. Morton? I look forward to Dr. Morton's leadership as chair in the year to come. At this point, I'd also like to recognize the program chairs for TOS and ASMBS's scientific and educational sessions. Jeff Zygman is chair and Lori Zeltzer co-chair for the Obesity Society Program Committee. The ASMBS program effort was led by program chair Natan Zindel and co-chair Shanu Kathari and integrated health program chair Maureen Quigley and co-chair Leslie Heinberg. Most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the people who really do the heavy lifting and the heavy thinking all year long to make Obesity Week a success. This is the outstanding staff members of ASMBS and TOS. They are listed here as you see them in the halls through the meeting. Please thank them for everything they've done to make this a reality and a success. All of the programming for this year's conference, yes. All of the programming for this year's conference is exceptional but I wanted to point out a few highlights for this year. In the TOS annual meeting, you'll notice that there are new cross-track themes related to dietary interventions and physical activity. There's also a new track for preparation for the American Board of Obesity Medicine exam. And you can filter the app program by track to see all the offerings in each of our excellent tracks. Another new feature 
uh, this year of the TOS program is that the schedule has been arranged to greatly increase the number of symposia that any one registrant can attend in the broad areas of basic science, population, health, and public policy. The ASMBS program is featuring new additions and enhancing a favorite from their spring meeting. ASMBS is debuting e-posters and quick shot oral abstract presentations in the exhibit hall. And then on Wednesday, ASMBS is bringing back the main event, four rounds of debates where you can place your bets to pick the grand champion. All bets support the ASMBS Foundation, which I can assure you is a worthier cause than the MGM. We're also very proud of our joint sessions on advocacy, cancer, adolescence, and tailored treatment. Can I have a big round of applause for the incredible scientific and educational programs these committees have put together? Thank you very much for your attention. At this time, I'd like to welcome back TOS President Alan Levine, who's going to tell you about today's distinguished keynote speaker. Well, folks, here's the real reason you're here this morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, one of the finest scientists in our field. Rudy Leibel is the director of the Division of Molecular Genetics and the Naomi Berry Diabetes Center at the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University. His research focuses on the genetics of obesity and non-insulin dependent diabetes, and his laboratory has mapped, cloned, and identified mutations in the obese and fatty genes in rats, in mice, and more recently, in humans. Dr. Leibel was selected to give our keynote presentation given his decades-long status as a leader in obesity research. Many of us remember in the early 90s that Dr. Leibel was involved in the seminal studies that significantly advanced our basic understanding of the physiological role of adipose tissue and its role as an active endocrine organ. This work fundamentally changed the way scientists view patients with obesity, no longer believing that obesity is a result of behavior alone. Dr. Leibel's many contributions to obesity research are the foundation for subsequent breakthroughs in understanding the disease of obesity. And as I said, we are truly honored to have him as our opening speaker for Obesity Week of 2017. Please welcome Dr. Leibel. Thank you for the nice introduction, Alan, and thanks to uh, John Morton and Patrick O'Neill for the invitation to speak to you today. The topic is as shown, and what I hope to do is to show you some of our more recent work in trying to develop cellular models of brain-based control of body weight and to convince you that these will be useful, they already are useful in terms of discovery of mechanisms of body weight regulation and I think ultimately for the development of uh, novel therapeutics. <clears throat> So unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, so I'll have to, you'll have to sort of get a gestalt of these slides, <clears throat> and I'll try to direct you right or left. This is an introduction to the, uh, the biology of stem cells, which I will follow with a uh, demonstration of their utility in type 2 diabetes as a sort of proof of principle and then show you some of the work on hypothalamic cells and then end by giving you some idea about some of the things we're trying to do as well as others. So they're basically in play now uh, two types of stem cells. On the left you see the classical uh, embryonic stem cell which is isolated from the inner cell mass, the blastocysts of, a, of an egg and can be grown in culture and will, if uh, uh, differentiated, form any cell type in the body. On the right is the newer version of stem cells, the induced pluripotent stem cell, here shown with some of the 
canonical so-called Yamanaka factors, which can be used to expose fibroblasts or other somatic cells in such a way as to cause them to revert to stem cell status, and those cells can then be uh, uh, differentiated as pluripotent cells into any uh, cell type in the body. These are the two standard uh, stem cell types, and I will talk to you a little bit about both. So here is the way that we're now generating patient-specific stem cells, that is, stem cells from individuals who are segregating for particular diseases of interest um, genetically conveyed. So you can see the patient there on the left, that's the pink person. We can take a biopsy of uh, skin or actually virtually any other somatic cell, and it can be converted into a stem cell in one of two ways. On the left, you see the Yamanaka factor approach, although those specific factors are often not used uh, at this point, to develop iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. And on the right, you see a technique which was developed at Columbia, actually, in which an embryonal stem cell from that individual can actually be generated by taking the nucleus out of the biopsied cell, fibroblast or other cell, and putting it into an egg which has been enucleated. That's the nuclear transfer. And that cell can then be uh, differentiated into a uh, totipotent uh, stem cell. So that's embryonal cell, that's somatic cell transfer which gives you a cell which has got the genetic material from the individual from whom it was isolated, and on the left is the differentiation directly from those cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. The induced pluripotent stem cells have as characteristics that they will retain some of the uh, transcription factor expression that's used to create them, such as OC4. This can potentially cause difficulties with teratoma formation and they do retain some of their epigenetic memory, as I'll show you when we talk about the Prader-Willi syndrome. The um, nuclear transfer cells don't have that characteristic, and for that reason may ultimately end up being uh, more useful for therapeutic purposes. So here's what it actually looks like. There's a, a somatic cell on the left. There are the transforming factors, and what you see on the right is a uh, stem cell. This is the iPS-derived stem cell. Here are the various uh, embryonal cell types, the uh, epithelial, mesoderm, and endoderm. And here you can see them up on the right there. And here they are differentiated into specific cell types of those uh, components of the embryo. So the gland, cartilage, and pigment cells from respectively the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. So virtually any cell type can be generated from these uh, stem cells. So do stem cell derived somatic and brain cells reflect the normal cell biology and pathology of their sources? This is obviously the critical or a critical question which informs their utility for subsequent use in terms of understanding the biology of disease and for therapeutic and uh, drug discovery purposes. So in order to convince you or try to convince you of their utility, I'm gonna show you an example in which I think this is really very clear, and that is, as proof of principle, the creation of beta cells in the manner that I just showed you of the islets of Langerhans and proof that they have full functional capacity. So we're able to derive mature pancreatic beta cells using a differentiation protocol like the one that you see here, developed by Lena Sui and uh, Dieter Egli's group at Columbia. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but what you see here is the gradual transformation of these cells through various, uh, em they're recapitulating the embryology of the development of the pancreas and islet until at the far right there, you have a cell which is functionally a, uh, a beta cell. This is done by sequentially exposing the developing cells to various of the factors that you see uh, below the, the schematic over time. 
And here is what they look like. These are some beta cells that were actually developed from a nuclear transfer embryonal stem cell. So these are cells that were created from moving the nucleus of a somatic cell into the enucleated uh, egg and then differentiating that towards stem cell status and then redifferentiating it towards beta cell status. This is what these clusters of cells look like. So here's an experiment now done with the uh, nuclear transfer ES cell. So we take these cells and uh, inject them under the skin or into the muscle of a nude mouse so that it will accept the human cells. These are human cells all the way. And here now this animal also receives, after getting that transplant, streptozotocin, which kills its endogenous beta cells but doesn't kill the human uh, beta cells, and on the left you can see the resting blood glucose levels of these animals. In green are the transplanted animals. Their only source of insulin now is from those human beta cells. In black you see animals who did not receive a transplant. Their blood glucose is going up. And the red is human islets transplanted into these animals. These islets are isolated from a human pancreas, and you can see that the transplanted stem cell-derived islets are performing just about as well as the human transplanted islets, and on the right you can see what happens if we take the, the uh, transplanted cells out of the animal, the blood glucose shoots up, as you would expect, to the level of animals that did not receive the uh, transplantation of human uh, beta cells derived from stem cells. Here's a glucose tolerance test of these same animals. In black, you can see the animals who didn't get the transplant. Their blood sugars go very high during the glucose uh, challenge intraperitoneally. And in red are the human transplanted islets. And in green are the uh, stem cell-derived beta cells. And you can see that these perform uh, identically. You can also see on the right that when these animals are fasted, as expected, the insulin levels go down and as they're given glucose or refed, the levels go up. So these beta cells are really performing uh, in parallel with the way a human islet does. So I hope this will convince you that cells derived this way uh, function as anticipated based on the um, biology of the cell that's been created. So now we'll get to the nitty gritty. So I did that to try to convince you that this is a plausible approach to the use of these cells, and now I'm going to show you some examples in which we've actually made hypothalamic neurons from exactly the same kind of uh, stem cells. So this is a little refresher on the anatomy of the nervous system, at least with regard to the areas that are major in terms of control of uh, food intake. These are coronal sections through a rodent uh, brain. Um, on the left, you can see the anterior portion of the hypothalamus, and on the upper part of the right area of the hypothalamus there, you see the PVN, the paraventricular nucleus. We will come back to that. I wanted to be sure to show that to you. You can also see the lateral hypothalamus and um, the occipital, uh, uh, the occipital nerve uh, decussation. On the right, and posterior to that, you can see the arcuate nucleus, which has the shape of a arc around the base of the third ventricle. This is the part of the hypothalamus which is exposed by various mechanisms to circulating molecules. It has been referred to often as the nose of the hypothalamus because of its ability to read circulating molecules. And then you can see again the uh, 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 dorsal medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. But the arcuate and the PVN are the two parts of the hypothalamus that I'm going to talk to you about most, uh, in most detail. So again, as a little refresher for you with regard to the function of the arcuate and the PVN, on the lower left part of the figure are the two major cell bodies of the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, the AGRP and NPY producing neurons, which produce orexigens, which signal to the PVH shown up there on the upper right in a way that increases uh, food intake by, among other things, blocking melanocortin-4 receptor activity and um, 
engaging G protein coupled receptors in the case of uh, NPY. And on the lower right, you can see the POMC producing neurons. These are the anorexigenic components of the hypothalamus. Proopiomelanocortin, POMC, is processed to produce alpha MSH. Alpha MSH travels up the axon towards the PVH to suppress food intake. So this is the proverbial yin and yang of the regulation of food intake. The NPY AGRP pro-orexigen, the uh, POMC expressing, CARD expressing neurons, anorexigenic. So again, we will come back to this issue of the communication between the arcuate and the PVN. The PVN being, in, in a sense, the sort of output center for the hypothalamus that both regulates food intake and energy expenditure in response to signals from the arcuate and other parts of the hypothalamus. So in order to make hypothalamic neurons, we needed to try to recapitulate aspects of the way that a normal hypothalamus develops in exactly the same way as was done for the beta cells. And here in this figure, you can see on the right a schematic of the early structure of the, um, of the brain, actually in this case of a rodent, showing the areas on top, the dorsal regions that go on to become cortex, and at the base in blue, the hypothalamus, and you can see a number of the transcription factors that are critical in terms of distinguishing the development of these different regions of the brain. And below, you can see stained the developing central nervous system, in this case of a rodent, showing on the bottom, which I've put an arrow hypothalamus on, that there is a, specifically the expression of a uh, NKX 2.1, which is uh, shown in green there, and uh, Fox G1, another transcription factor characteristic of the parts of the brain that will develop the uh, upper part, the, the dorsal part of the brain, and the cortex. And what we were trying to do was to get NKX 2.1, Fox G1 negative cells, so that we would get cells that favored the development of the hypothalamus. And again, here's another one of these roadmaps. You don't need to study the details of this, but again, you can see laid out here over time, the exposure over time of the stem cells shown at the bottom on the left towards NKX 2.1 expressing cells shown in the middle, and then on the right, you actually see neurons that were created by this differentiating protocol into POMC and NPY expressing cells. Remember the POMC are the anorexigenic, the NPY, AGRP, orexigenic, and if you look closely, you'll actually see that some of these cells are co-expressing those neuropeptides, as expected in the sort of ontogeny of the hypothalamus. So this protocol was actually developed largely um, in a um, uh, experimental way by fiddling with the various components that were added so that the so-called SMADs were uh, inhibited. Sonic Hedgehog, SHH, was brought in at various points in time, uh, and notch signaling was interfered with as well. And, this was, uh, resulted in the production of these um, arcuate neurons on the lower right. So if you look at those cells, and you can see over time, um, the, uh, ex this is the expression pattern of these cells. This is sometimes referred to as a heat map. On the right, up and down the border, you see various transcription factors and other genes that are expressed. And here, what we're showing you is that on day 27 and day um, 82, the expression pattern of these cells in vitro compared to uh, hypothalamic uh, human tissue. And what you can see is that these cells are moving gradually towards an expression pattern which is compatible with the human hypothalamus. And on the right are specific genes that are expressed in these cells, again, over time. And on the left, uh, you, see the, uh, you, uh, you see the development of these uh, cells, the development of these expression patterns over time. And I call your attention to the fact that NKX 2.1, up on the left there, you can see it's high to begin with, as we expected. 
and then as the cells develop, it drops off. And you can see in purple human hypothalamus being compared to the expression levels of these various components of the human hypothalamus, various parts of the hypothalamus um, being looked at. So SIM1 on the bottom there is a uh, transcription factor we'll come back to, which is highly expressed in the PVH. And you can see that these cells early express it, and then they reduce their level of expression because they're going towards arcuate performance, and SF1 is a VMH characteristic uh, transcription factor, also low in these cells, uh, but high in whole human hypothalamus. This gives us um, confidence that we've actually created cells that are, um, uh, resemble the cell type that we're trying to create, in this case, arcuate neuron. So now let me show you the clinical application of some of these uh, cells. First, with regard to the Bardet beetle syndrome, a autosomal recessive form of obesity that many of you have probably encountered uh, in clinical practice. This is a sort of a schematic summary of the disease. They're, these patients have severe retinitis pigmentosa and go blind. They have uh, polycystic kidneys, which you can see in the B figure. They have polydactyly, postaxial polydactyly, both hands and feet, and they are very obese. At least 18 unique genes have been implicated in the Bardet beetle syndrome, and all of the genes that have been identified that, actually, that is actually cloned are components of something called the primary uh, cilium. And I'll show you a primary cilium in a minute. Much of that work done by uh, Nico Katsanis. There's a reference there if you want to read more about the biology and molecular genetics of the Bardet beetle syndrome. So here's a schematic of the primary cilium. You need to know a little bit about this to understand what I'm going to show you. So on the left there, where you see BBS1 cilia, the cilia is stained in uh, red or orange, and at the base of it are stains for the BBS1. Remember, there are 18 flavors of Bardet beetle. They look very similar clinically, but different genes are the basis for the, for the, in specific individuals. And they've been numbered, BBS1, 2, 3, 4. So that's a BBS1 cilium. And you can see on the right images of cilia for other uh, Bardet beetle um, syndrome patients. In the schematic, what I'm trying to show you is that this organelle, which is also part of the centrosome that mediates cell division, when it's on the surface of the cell, acts like an antenna, and molecules can ride up and down on the primary cilium, and some of the signaling molecules that are known to or suspected to ride on the primary cilium are shown listed on the left, so Sonic, Sonic Hedgehog and Wnt, which I mentioned before in the differentiation protocol, the um, uh, melanocyte concentrating hormone receptor, MCHR1, um, and others are listed there. A question has arisen whether the leptin receptor, um, the melanocortin-4 receptor, the insulin receptor may also be riding on this primary cilium. And the reason that the Bardet beetle syndrome produces obesity may have to do with interfering with the signaling processes that are conveyed or through the primary cilium. And you can see in purple various of the members of the primary, um, of the Bardet beetle components of the primary uh, cilium, the so-called uh, BB zone. So one of the things we were interested in is could we use neurons created from BBS patients to try to answer some of these questions with regard to the mechanism behind the obesity in the Bardet beetle syndrome, because clearly it has something to do with the function of the primary cilium. So here are some uh, electron micrographs of Bardet beetle uh, mutation um, uh, cells. On the top left, you see the wild type. That nice little thin thing sticking out there with the arrow is a nice skinny uh, primary cilium. And you can see it on the right B from the top down. You see the components of the primary cilium. 
And on the bottom, E and F, you see Bard 8 beetle primary cilia, which you don't have to be an expert in electron microscopy to see that they look like ping pong paddles rather than the normal thin structure that is anticipated in a normal primary cilia. So here's our version, or one version, of the primary cilium simply looked at now for length in Bardi beetle iPSC-derived arcuate neuron. So on the left, you see the control. You see the green is staining the, the cilium itself, and the red, the tubulin, is at the base, the red base of the, of the primary cilium. And if you look at the control, BBS1, BBS10, you can see the primary cilia quite beautifully in these little neurons. And if you look below where we have ciliary length, you can see that the length of the cilia, just measured in a, with a light micro, micro, by light microscopy, is anatomically longer. So there is a structural derangement of the primary cilium anticipated by virtue of what I showed you earlier, which is visible simply by light microscopy of arcuate neurons derived using iPS cells in the manner I showed you earlier from patients with the Bardi beetle syndrome. Here is further study of the Bardi beetle uh, anatomic, if you will, uh, phenotype of these iPS derived cells. So here what I'm showing you is measurements of the length, the mean outgrowth number, and length of the outgrowths per cell simply by uh, light microscopy in these cells. And you can see that in the BBS-derived cells, 1 in 10, the outgrowths are um, uh, shorter and the number reduced. So you can see a gross anatomic consequence of the BBS mutation in these iPS-derived neurons. There's no question that there are structural abnormalities in the brains of patients with BBS. You can see these uh, with uh, CT scan or MRI. So the fact that we can see structural changes in the cell, in the, in the connections between these cells is fully consistent with what's known about the anatomy of the BBS uh, brain. Now we get to the question of whether the leptin receptor, which as you know is the signaling molecule for leptin, is playing a role. So here on the left, I'm showing you animals who are conveying, segregating for BBS mutations. These mutations have been introduced to the, into these animals by uh, transgenic techniques. And you can see the response of these animals to uh, the provision of leptin. Uh, a, on the left, you can see that the BBS animals don't change weight when they're exposed to leptin, whereas the control animal in blue there drops its body weight. And on the right, you see the uh, corresponding uh, change in food intake. The BBS animals are resistant to the action of leptin, whereas the control animal drops its body weight. And below, in a series of um, Western blots, we're looking at, not we, but the authors of this paper, looking at the downstream signaling mechanisms for the leptin receptor, which is phosphostat-3. That's the P-stat-3. And you can see that in the uh, knockout animals, the KO animals, that there is reduced PSTAT3 generation in response to leptin. So these animals are acting as if they are resistant to leptin, suggesting that the leptin receptor may be interacting with the primary cilium in these animals. And here is an experiment that we, that we did in which we now looked at the BBS IPS derived neurons on the left, you see the controls. There's the PSTAT3, which is the signaling mechanism for the leptin receptor. On the right, a BBS-derived uh, cells. And you can see that when we expose the control cells to leptin, shown at the bottom panel, the PSTAT3 lights up. And it's much weaker in the, in the BBS neurons. And you can see the equivalent or the corresponding, excuse me, uh, Western blot on the right. Again, in the, if you look at the BBS10A, no signaling going on when those cells are exposed to leptin or reduced. And here below are some more BBS cells, again, showing 
abnormality under response to leptin fully consistent with what's seen in the mice and suggesting that the leptin receptor may actually be affiliating on the primary cilium and that that may be a mechanism for, or one mechanism for the obesity that's seen in prader willi patients, uh, Bardet beetle patients, sorry. Here is a second signaling mechanism which affects body weight, that's the insulin receptor. So in the same cell types, we now looked at various components of the insulin receptor cascade. There's the insulin receptor in blue, the IRS, uh, IRS insulin receptor substrate, um, uh, PS, uh, you can, and then down all the way to phospho uh, AKT, PI3 kinase to phospho AKT. And again, if you look at the what happens when we expose the Bardet beetle cells to insulin, we get reduced phospho AKT, which is the signaling mechanism corresponding to what happens with leptin with PSTAT3 in terms of the ability to signal insulin. This again, fully consistent with the idea that there may be deficiency of insulin signaling in the brain of these uh, animals. Um, which could, again, of these individuals, which could confer further susceptibility to obesity. On the right there, where you see flag BBS10, we put the BBS gene back into the cells by transfecting them, and we're able to restore insulin signaling. That's the PAKT right at the top. You can see the BBS10 now signaling uh, quite competently. So again, suggesting that the deficiency of insulin signaling, which could be a component of the hyperphagia and obesity of these patients, is rectifiable by putting a normal um, BBS gene, a non-mutant gene, back into the individuals. And just to confirm the idea that there may be a relationship between the primary cilium <clears throat> and the insulin receptor, on the left you see efforts to, sh to isolate the insulin receptor from the surface of mouse embryonic fibroblasts and HEK293 cells, those are human kidney cells. And what you see on the left, A there, the BBS1 um, mutant uh, cells from those mice, no surface insulin receptor. That's the place where the insulin receptor would be if it were interacting with the primary cilium. And on the right, you see the equivalent in another cell type below are the plots, actually, of the um, amount of insulin receptor on the surface versus the total. And you can see that in all instances in the Bardet beetle, the surface receptor uh, level is reduced. Again, consistent with the idea that the primary cilium is interacting with both the insulin receptor and the leptin receptor, and that that may be an important part of the mechanism underlying the obesity in the patients with uh, BBS. So let me show you a second example. So that, I would say, is an example of the use of these cells to understand the basic biology of the etiology of these disturbances. Let me now show you the prader willi syndrome, in which I think we made a discovery with regard to the underlying uh, etiology of that disturbance, or at least a contributor uh, to it. This is, these are patients with the prader willi syndrome. Again, many of you in this room are undoubtedly familiar with this disturbance. I'm not going to read all of this. You can read it yourself, but they have a very characteristic uh, clinical phenotype <clears throat> that includes a series of endocrine phenotypes as well as cognitive and hyperphagia. So adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, short stature due to growth hormone deficiency, hypoinsulinemia, type 2 diabetes, and elevated ghrelin. I just went ahead and read it to you, despite the fact I told you I went. So forgive me for that. Um, hypergrelinemia received a lot of attention early on when ghrelin was discovered, because ghrelin is a proorexigenic peptide, uh, again, acting in the hypothalamus. And it was thought that maybe the hypergrelinemia was the etiology of uh, the prader willi syndrome, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. So again, as many of you are probably aware, the prader willi syndrome is the result 
of absence of the paternal alleles in an imprinted region of chromosome 15Q. And I'm showing you here a schematic of that uh, interval. The uh, blue genes are um, paternally expressed. So if you don't have the paternal copy of this region of the uh, chromosome 15, um, you have no copies because the maternal copies are imprinted or silenced, as they uh, say. <clears throat> and five or six humans in the world have been identified who don't necessarily have the larger deletions, which are shown in the BP1, 2, and 3. Those are the sort of perimeters of the, of the major causes of Prader-Willi, these two major deletion um, uh, phenotypes. There are, like I said, five or six humans who've been identified with micro deletions, which are in the area of that salmon colored box that include only three genes, one of which we are particularly interested in for reasons you're going to see in a moment, called SNORD116. And those individuals in the salmon box have phenotypes that are virtually identical to those of patients with the bigger deletions. They're missing just those three genes from the paternal um, alleles, and because the maternal are silenced, they are, um, those genes aren't expressed in those individuals. So it looks like one of those three or all three are sufficient to produce the phenotype. SNORD116 is a gene which is a so-called non-canonical small nucleolar RNA, uh, SNO RNA, which has none of the usual ribosomal RNA targets. It's a, it's a transcript without a known function. It is highly expressed in the hypothalamus and the arcuate and the PVN. Loss of SNORD116 <clears throat> and the other two genes that I mentioned is sufficient to cause all of the PWS phenotypes in humans. And there are some mice that are of great interest. The SNORD116 P negative, M positive. That means the paternal alleles are missing. The maternal alleles are present. Maternal alleles are silent. So these are uh, deficient for SNORD116. And what do those mice look like? Low growth hormone. Impaired motor learning, hypoinsulinemia, hypergrelinemia, and hyperphagia relative to lean body mass. In other words, they look like they're recapitulating some of the phenotypes of the Prader-Willi syndrome. So here's what we did. We took uh, individuals who were deleted <coughs> for, excuse me, We took individuals and made uh, IPS-derived neurons from them. Some had large deletion, that's the large deletion, and one individual we managed to make IPS-derived neurons from a micro-deletion patient. That's another heat map you see in the middle there, which shows you genes that are up or down regulated in these cells when we uh, sequence the RNA. And you can see they look very similar to each other, which is what you would expect. On the left, you can see that we're not getting a deficiency or any difference in the number of neurons formed in the differentiation protocol. But these uh, Prader-Willi um, cells have very characteristic expression patterns. And I already told you they're totally deficient in SNORD116, which is not expressed. And interestingly, we found two genes that were very reduced in the Prader-Willi. One is NHLH2, and the other is PCSK1. NHLH2 is a transcription factor which regulates many genes in um, development and, and, and during normal function. And PCSK1 is proconvertase 1, is the, is the gene that encodes proconvertase 1, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But this signature of these cells guided us to these two uh, genes. So here now you're seeing the fact that when we look at NHLH2 and PCSK1, as I told you on the top, you can see that the transcript levels of NHLH2 and PCSK1 are decreased in both the um, 
minimal deletion and the large deletion. The MD is the minimal deletion. In blue, you can see that in both instances, the transcripts are down, and the protein, if anything, for both of these genes is down even more. So these cells are rather severely deficient in both NHLH2 and PCSK1. So why do we care about this? So PCSK1, is, aka proconvertase or prohormone convertase, is part of a group of pro, uh, protein convertases. And what it does is it acts like a scissor in snipping out the, the mature part of a proprotein to give you what's shown on the right, the active hormone from the prohormone. And virtually all of the neuropeptides that I have mentioned so far come delivered in the cell as a prohormone that must be processed in order to um, get the active form. So the proconvertase deficiency is very interesting with regard to its potential for accounting for some of the interesting phenotypes in the Prader-Willi syndrome whose etiology heretofore had not been sort of well understood. I'm not sure it is yet, but this is certainly in the, in the right direction. So let me remind you again, this is our schematic. Here on the uh, right, uh, in little uh, yellow boxes, I have now put some of the peptides that are processed by prohormone convertase. So on the top, in the PVH neurons, uh, oxytocin, BDNF, CRH, which is the releasing factor for corticotropin, TRH. And in the arcuate neurons, Proopiomelanocortin is processed by um, proconvertase to alpha MSH, and CART comes also an orexigenic peptide comes in the form of a proprotein. So virtually all of these peptides are processed peptides, and you can imagine that a derangement in their processing could screw up the biology of the hypothalamus at the level of the arcuate and or the PVH. So what about what's known about PCSK1 or proconvertase uh, deficiency. On the right, a picture of one of the five or four or five children, four or five individuals who've been identified with autosomal recessive proconvertase deficiency due to PCSK1 mutations. And look at the phenotypes of that or those individuals. They're hyperphagic, hypogonadal, growth hormone deficient, starting to sound familiar. Um, hypothyroid, adrenal insufficient, et cetera. And here, in case you missed the point, there are the Prader-Willi phenotypes, which line up quite well relative to individuals who are lacking only uh, PCSK1. Uh, Hyperproinsulinemia, very characteristic of PCSK1 mutation, not reported yet in Prader-Willi, but we have seen in some very early experiments evidence of this um, in the, in the Prader-Willi individuals and in cells isolated from them, beta cells isolated from them. So these phenotypes virtually overlap. Now, what about NHLH2 and PCSK1 deficiency as possible causes of obesity? I've already said something about this. On the left, you see the NHLH2 knockout mouse, hyperphagic obesity, hypogonadism. It gets a phenotype very similar to a PCSK1 deficient human or mouse. And then you, on the right, you can see the Prader-Willi patients, for whom now I'm going to show you that there is strong evidence of impaired prohormone processing. On the top is just a little schematic of a uh, region of the genome which is regulating PCSK1, showing you that both NHLH2 and the leptin receptor downstream signaling molecule PSTAT3, which I mentioned before, both are active in the regulation of uh, uh, PCSK1, fully consistent with the formulation I've sort of implied. So here is some, I could show you a number of different uh, things that we've studied, but here is ghrelin. I want to thought many of you would be interested in seeing this. So this is pro-ghrelin processing in SNORD-116 deficient mice. And what you can see is that the circulating, remember now, these are the animals that have no uh, paternal 116 and are PCSK1 deficient. You can see that these animals have elevated circulating levels of um, uh, ghrelin 
um, somewhat reduced PCSK. This is in, in uh, stomach from these uh, animals on the upper right. Uh, very decreased SNORD-116, as you would expect due to the mutation. And in the lower left, you see PC1 protein, which is reduced in the stomach of these animals, and preprogrelin, which is highly increased. Um, as on, on the right, you also see in a uh, PC1 knockout mouse. So what's the take-home message here? Ghrelin is not being properly processed in the SNORD-116 mouse. The levels of circulating ghrelin are elevated, but in other studies that we've done, we've shown that what's really circulating is pro-ghrelin, pre-pro-ghrelin. It's not the mature ghrelin that's elevated in the blood of these animals, and the assays for ghrelin and pre-pro-ghrelin don't make any distinct distinction between these. So we think that the hypergrelinemia of Prader-Willi syndrome is real, but what's really circulating is a relatively hypoactive form of ghrelin, not likely to be the primary cause of the hyperphagia. It's an artifact of the fact that this um, normally processed peptide is being secreted from the stomach uh, in an uh, imperfectly processed form. This is a busy slide. If I had a pointer, I would show it to you, but what I'm trying to show you is that in the Prader-Willi patients as well, panels A and B, we can see morphologic abnormalities in terms of the mean cell body area of these individual cells um, in both the, uh, uh, in, in, in Prader-Willi cells in black and blue there. And on the far right, looking at the uh, hypothalamus of um, SNORD-116 deficient animals, very comparable phenotype. So the phenotype that we see in the iPS-derived neurons on the left and in the um, uh, SNORD-116 mice on the right is very similar. And on the lower panel on the right, way down on the right, you can see actually that the cell bodies stained in green of wild-type SNORD-116 neurons are b bigger in the wild type than in the mutant animals. And you can even in the red there on the lower right see that the nucleolus, nu nucleolus which is where the SNORD-116 is expressed, is reduced and get comparable phenotypes in cerebellar uh, cells as well shown in the panel on the left. So what I'm showing you here is that we can see in both the mice and the human derived neurons clear morphologic changes in the structure with which the, these cells form and interact with each other in terms of the mean processing. Again, consistent with the kind of thing I showed you about the Bardet beetle. So let me now talk to you about PC1 deficiency, which is obviously very relevant to the situation in, uh, um, in Prader-Willi. Here's the patient that I mentioned to you before, or a patient I mentioned to you before in the phenotype. Here's the... Uh, Prader-Willi. So we're very interested in, in understanding better what the proconvertase enzyme is doing under circumstances in which the neurons are insufficiently uh, provided with that um, peptide. So this is, again, a little busy. If I had a pointer, I'd make it easier on you. But on the top is a pathway that many of you are probably familiar with, which is the processing of pro-opio-melanocortin to ACTH and then to a series of smaller peptides, alpha MSH, which is critical in terms of signaling to the PVH, as I mentioned before, and beta endorphin. And if you look at this figure, you'll see the places where the proconvertase uh, is active. So we actually took um, human neurons and knocked down PCSK1 using uh, short hairpin RNAs and studied the, uh, if you will, the neuropeptide uh, signature of these cells. So on the, in B there, you can see this is the, actually a human embryonal stem cell um, derived by somatic cell nuclear transfer in which we knocked down PCSK1. You can see it's very highly knocked down in the stem cell. And from that cell, we then develop the, uh, the neurons, and you can see the neuron, which has very low PCSK1, 
But interestingly, the POM C in that cell is elevated, which is what you would predict if POM C couldn't be processed properly to its downstream products, which are shown at the top. And you can see that the ACTH um, to uh, POM C level is altered in these cells, again, uh, showing a deficiency due to the lack of uh, processing of pro POM C to uh, derivative peptides downstream. And the other parts of the figure are showing the relationship, for example, of alpha MSH to POM C, where you can see in the F panel that the alpha MSH being produced relative to POM C is greatly reduced in these cells, as is beta endorphin, exactly what you would predict from that uh, schematic above. So we can see the phenotype, if you will, in these human neurons. And here is further detail of this. And what I wanted to make a point about here is the following. Even though the alpha MSH production per POM C molecule is reduced, the amount of POM C is increased due to misprocessing. So in panel A, what you see is that in cells in which we've knocked out PC1, there's still uh, alpha MSH being secreted. So the cells are not actually deficient in alpha MSH as we thought they might be, simply because there's increased substrate for them. And in B, you can see the fact that that's the case. The alpha MSH produced per unit of POM C is reduced, but the total alpha MSH is not impaired. Then look at panel E, where when we look at secretion of these peptides, which is what I'm showing you in most of this figure, that the amount of ACTH being secreted is greatly reduced in the, um, in the mutant cell line. ACTH, again, as many of you know, um, is itself a neuropeptide that can influence food intake. So although we thought maybe the Prader-Willi phenotype was due to MSH deficiency, uh, alpha MSH deficiency, that doesn't appear to be the case, at least based on these in vitro studies, but maybe uh, ACTH is playing a role. And I'll come back to this uh, theme in a, in a moment. And if you look at the panel C with the yellow highlight, quite interestingly, the amount of receptor for these uh, um, proteins, particularly for melanocortin-4, is increased in these cells that are deficient, or at least relatively deficient, in alpha MSH. Again, possibly compensating for the consequences of the PC1 um, deficiency. The reason I like this is that it gives us a handle in a way that we can work with the neurobiology in a way that would not be accessible, obviously, if we had to use human, human brains. So here's a schematic of the PC1 deficiency and some of our ideas about the uh, genetics. So on the left, the SNORD-116 is clearly deleted in these individuals, and NHLH2 and proconvertase 1 are reduced. NHLH2 may actually be participating by driving down um, proconvertase 1 gene expression, PCSK1, or maybe operating um, independently. And if you now look at the pathways that are influenced by PCSK1, you see on the top, pro-opio-melanocortin, oxytocin, BDNF, I've mentioned some of these uh, earlier, all require proconvertase. Ghrelin, which I mentioned earlier, growth hormone, releasing hormone, um, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and pro-insulin, all require uh, PC1, and you can see the P PWS phenotypes on the right, fully consistent with a processing defect due to this single protein being deficient. Now remember, the protein itself, the PC1, is fine. It's not, it's, it itself is not in that interval. It is down as a result of the driving force of SNORD-116 and HLH2 uh, on its, on it, and or NHLH2 on its, on its expression. But that deficiency is sufficient to account for much of the phenotype of these individuals, although I just showed you some data that bring the POMC hypothesis into some uh, question. Oxytocin, which is a PVH neuron mentioned in the schematic here, a known um, anorexigenic um, 
peptide, which has been approached therapeutically in a number of ways in uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. Here actually are counts of the number of oxytocin neurons by age in individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome and controls, and on the right, um, uh, vasopressin neurons, both of which are present in the, in the PVH. And you can see on the left that there is a deficiency of these neurons. How this develops or rises could be at least potentially due to the fact that if you back up pro-oxytocin uh, processing, it may itself ultimately um, jack up the uh, ER stress response in these cells and end up by by killing them. Because this is a well-known phenotype when handling of proteins is interfered with. So there clearly is a deficiency of oxytocin neurons in these individuals. Their phenotypes are not, um, are, are potentially explicable in part due to deficiencies of oxytocin, not just the hyperphagia, but some of the um, behavioral uh, aspects that uh, characterize the Prader-Willi syndrome. So let me end by simply pointing out a number of uh, potential applications for this technology. Obviously, I've shown you some already, but I want to just run through a few that show you what we're up to uh, now in terms of its sort of forward applications. Gene discovery, the generation of hypothalamic organoids, and uh, therapeutics. So this is a, a, a very conventional kind of uh, nuclear family pedigree. It's one that we've collected over the years. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we're using families like this that all of you in this room, or certainly the majority of you, have seen where there appears to be, or certainly is consistent with a segregating um, genetic basis for severe early onset obesity in the seven-year-old who is a proband. So what we've been doing is listed on the right. And in this particular family, based on whole exome sequencing, we have identified 11 candidate genes whose function is inactivated by virtue of severe mutations of genes. And now what we're in the process of doing, or actually have done, is to ex uh, assess the organs in which those candidate genes are expressed. We're very CNS oriented, so we would look for genes of that group of 11 that are expressed in the brain, and we now have the ability to manipulate those genes, as I just showed you for BBS and Prader-Willi, in um, stem cell-derived uh, cells. We can do this by either taking cells from the affected individuals, or now, quite commonly, what we do is use a technique called CRISPR, which you've undoubtedly heard about. We just produce the mutation in the stem cell and then differentiate it towards the uh, cell type that we're interested in. And then we can study the transcript pattern of those cells, as we did for the Prader-Willi, look at their um, uh, development, their anatomic and functional uh, analyses, as I showed you uh, earlier, to try to understand which of the mutations implicated by whole exome sequencing is playing a role. These then can be studied, of course, in mouse and other in vivo models. The cells themselves can be put into nude mice, into the brain of mice, in order to examine their development and function. And these cells can, of course, be used for drug screen. So we can take these cells and expose them to agents to see which, based on the mutation might be helpful in terms of getting around the mutation or uh, otherwise altering the function downstream to rescue the phenotype, so to speak. So this is, I think, a very uh, interesting and growing uh, use of stem cells to really recapitulate in vitro what uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able or hadn't been able to do um, it, with regard to human biology. We're also interested in making organoids. So I've shown you arcuate neurons that we created, but we're also interested in making hypothalamic, um, whole hypothalamic organoids, so that instead of just having arcuate or just PBH, they would have the major cell bodies of the hypothalamus in a single uh, organoid. And what I'm showing you here is that this has been done successfully with regard to the cerebral 
uh, cortex, and in the bottom you can actually see, this is an altered differentiation protocol on top, and you can see on the bottom what looks like, it's not too hard to imagine, uh, aspects of uh, uh, cerebral cortex. Um, for technical reasons, it's, it's easier to make cerebral cortex than to make indistinct uh, hypothalamic neuronal cell bodies, but we're working on this, ultimately trying to uh, create an intact hypothalamic organoid. These organoids, these cerebral organoids, fully uh, reflect the structural consequences of mutations such as microcephaly. So they're, these, again, are, are true to the genetics from which they are generated. And here's what we're now trying to do. So on the right, you will see, again, uh, this is a schematic of the hypothalamus again, there's the arcuate down below in red, the ventral medial hypothalamus in orange, very important in the control of blood glucose now, and the PVH, which I have mentioned repeatedly. And on the right, I'm showing you some of the peptides that are characteristic of these uh, cell bodies, and they're very distinct. I mean, if we know the transcriptional repertoire of a cell, I can tell you from which part of the hypothalamus it has come. And on the left, are the transcription factors, the, the, the uh, regulatory genes that characterize these various components of the hypothalamus. And you'll remember NKX 2.1 uh, down below, and OTP, which is the um, gene that drives um, or is responsible to some extent for the development of the oxytocin capability in the PVH. So we know the transcriptional repertoire of these cells to some extent, and what we're now trying to do is to create an organoid which will talk across these three major cell bodies in the hypothalamus, starting with trying to develop PVH neurons that we can um, put in juxtaposition to the arcuate neurons that we've already made, completing that major regulatory circuit from the arcuate to the PVH. And the way that we're going about this is to actually sequence single cells, look at the RNA transcript profile of single cells from the PVH of young mice. You can see the mouse on the left and the region of the PVH in green. We're isolating these cells individually and actually sequencing their RNA in the individual cells to try to get a complete picture of the transcriptional factors that regulate the development of the PVH so that we can then recapitulate that developmental uh, repertoire in uh, stem cells to get PVH neurons in very similar to the way we did with the arcuate, but this time using transcription factors rather than um, proteins. This will give us a very important tool, I think, for being able, to, again, to better understand many types of obesity, but particularly uh, Prader-Willi. And then finally, what about therapeutic uses? This must have occurred to some of you. So you've seen this figure before. So iPS-derived neurons can be used as now as cellular substrates for therapeutics. So here are the minimum deletion and the large deletion PCSK1 transcript and protein, which I showed you earlier. And it's not rocket science to realize that these cells can now be exposed to uh, agents of various kinds to see whether we can increase the activity of the proconvertase um, gene, which remember is not in the line of deletion. It's intact, it's perfectly intact, it's just under stimulated. So these cells can now be used for basically for drug discovery, which is an area that we're obviously interested in. So, in summary, I hope you agree, human stem cell-derived somatic and brain cells reflect the uh, anticipated cell autonomous characteristics. This is good news. They're true to the source. They're therefore useful in the deconvolution of genetics and mechanistic analyses of human disease and for therapeutic uh, drug discovery. They are plausible, ultimately, for use in cell replacement strategies for human disease. So those beta cells that I showed you, we are very interested in ultimately 
uh, being able to use those to treat uh, diabetes. I think it's obviously a ways off that we would use these neuronal cells for uh, replacement strategies, but they certainly will be helpful for understanding mechanism and discovery of new agents. This is a new frontier, I think, with great promise and important bioethical implications that I don't need to go into the details of. But obviously, we are um, uh, in a position now to manipulate uh, organ systems and biology in a way that we were not earlier. So let me end by simply indicating the people who did this work. Uh, Lisa Cole Burnett on the upper left is the progenitor of the um, prader willi studies. Li Heng Wang in the middle there uh, did the Bardi Beetle studies. Dieter Egli, lower left, is a uh, stem cell biologist who oversaw much of what I have talked about. Wendy Chung, a human geneticist who was helpful in obtaining human samples. Charles Leduc, uh, research scientist who has participated in virtually all of the studies I showed you. Lin Shan Chang was one of the people, along with Lena Sui, who developed the early protocols for the creation of uh, human beta cells. Um, Maria Caterina de Rosa, shown on the bottom left there, name got knocked off, is working on the isolation of the PVH neurons for uh, sequencing. Robin Golan, who is co-director of the Berry Center, um, has been instrumental in helping with the acquisition of patients. Brian Gonzalez in the middle there um, has been working on prader willi um, beta cells. And Claudia Doge on the left, um, along with Dieter, recently participated actually in a cancer-related bike ride. This is the two of them suitably turned out. Claudia is a stem cell biologist who has led much of the work on the generation of the, of the PVH neuron. You can't read this very well, but these are many of our collaborators and many other institutions. Mate Tauber, who is down at the lower right, is the individual um, who helped us to obtain the minimum deletion uh, prader willi uh, patient. Here is the support that we've had, and I, well, you can read it. Um, and we're currently working very closely with Levo Therapeutics, which is a company recently started by a parent of a patient with prader willi syndrome to try to take some of the discovery that I have just described for you into actual, apply it for uh, clinical use. I want to thank you, and I want to make one sort of further comment, or I want to make two further comments. One, if you have patients with extreme obesity or familial obesity, we are very interested in these guys um, and their evaluation. You may contact me by email. I can't turn it back now, but um, not hard to find. There we go. Um, and the other point I want to make is that we are like the Marines, always looking for a few good people. And if you yourself are interested or know of others who might be interested in pursuing this work, I really think it is a, uh, a new frontier and one that will repay the efforts of the young and the restless, as I uh, showed you earlier. So thanks for your attention. Dr. Leibel, I, for your talk. We appreciate it Thank very you. much. We have a Thank plaque you, in your Thanks. honor. This is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Leibel, and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, it's time to get that free cup of coffee in the exhibit hall, so you can head that way and check out some of the exhibits and posters. Uh, and maybe stop by Obesity Week backstage to uh, chat with Dr. Leibel in person. The concurrent sessions will start at 10.15 after the break, and we are adjourned. <laughs>